<laughs> okay, so hello everyone and welcome to today's seminar talk. I'm happy to introduce Qingcheng Wang from the Machine Learning Research Group at Oxford as our speaker today. Uh, he will talk about his out to RL work on Bayesian generational population based training. So again, thank you, Xing Xing, for being here. I'm really excited about hearing about this work and the stage is yours. You can start. <laughs> cool, cool. Uh, if somehow I can't see my cursor on the laptop. I, I just want to, uh, just a second. All right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So uh, thank you very much for having me today. So um, as introduced, my name is Xing Chen. Uh, and today I'm presenting our paper, uh, Bayesian Generational Population-Based Training, uh, presented at uh, the AutoML conference this year. Um, and this is a joint work with Tom, Jack, uh, Phil, Wu, Bingxing, and Michael. And then, yeah, I will just go straight to the presentation. Uh, so I just want to give a like a very brief introduction into like reinforcement learning and auto RL, uh, especially I guess um, many of you will be very familiar with most of the concept. Um, so RL has been very successful as we may know um, in various domains um, and is also often seen as a path to artificial general intelligence. Uh, but one of the issues that we often see in RL is that um, a typical RL algorithm can feature uh, like more than a dozen hyperparameters and the RL performance can is also shown to be very sensitive to the hyperparameters. And we often see that uh, for same algorithm, let's say PPO, applying a same set of hyperparameters to all the problems that we see often lead to suboptimal performance. In some cases, it doesn't even train at all. And in some cases, we'll even have to tune, like, for example, random seeds. So on the research point of view, that creates its own challenges because uh, it often leads to high variance in just different seed of the same algorithm, making it very difficult to compare uh, across different algorithms. And on the practical side, I think if you have an algorithm that is that sensitive, it is also difficult to apply them to in a practical setting in a convincing way. So. Um, there are a lot of work, a lot of attention in trying to stabilize RL. And uh, one of the typical uh, set of approaches is auto RL, um, often derived from auto ML, because we have seen uh, how automated machine learning has been useful in tuning, let's say, supervised learning systems. Um, but RL has its own challenges, such as non stationarity and like the increased sensitivity that I mentioned, because we also often observe that. The op optimal hyperparameters themselves can shift during training. Uh, so that require adaptation of uh, hyperparameters on the fly. And another thing, another issue we have identified is um, auto RL so far has mainly focused on tuning hyperparameters. Uh, but from neural architecture search in supervised learning systems, we already know that the architectures can aff affect the performance as well. And RL also used uh, quite extensively the deep neural networks, such as the policy and uh, value networks. So we will, that, we, that also led us to wonder whether we can tune architectures and whether there's any benefit in doing so in reinforcement learning as well. So this is what our work trying to do. So in our paper, we propose space and generational population-based training or BGPPT in short. So this is a general purpose auto RL algorithm based on the PBT paradigm. Uh, but instead of just tuning the hyperparameters of the agent, it tunes both architectures and hyperparameters. And to do that, we use the model, but we use a like surrogate uh, based model using Bayesian optimization. Uh, and we use a tailored BO agent uh, that is adapted to the modestly high dimensional and mixed space and time varying problems that we have. Uh, it is high dimensional because, as I said, in RL, we tune like more than a dozen of hyperparameters. It's not extremely high dimensional, but it's still like modestly high dimensional. It's mixed space because in RL hyperparameters, we typically have different types of hyperparameters uh, for things like learning rate and um, 
weight decay, for example, we have uh, continuous variables. And for other things, let's say the number of neurons or the depths of the policy and value network, uh, we have an ordinal variable. And we found that our algorithm discover a curriculum of architectures and hyperparameters uh, made possible by generational training via distillation across agents of architecture of different architectures um, in, diff in the population. And then finally, we experimentally validated uh, the algorithm on BRAX uh, and we mainly use PPO. So before I talk in depth about our algorithm, I just want to uh, spend some time talking about population-based training or PBT. So uh, this is an algorithm developed by the DeepMind um, researchers back in 2017. So the key idea is instead of tuning the agent in a sequential manner, uh, what we do is we start a population with different agents, with different hyperparameters and weights. And the idea is to tune them in a parallel setting. So we just take, in terms of work clock time, it is uh, comparable to the training of a single agent, but we leverage the parallelism and at regular intervals allow uh, the weight and hyperparameters to update uh, based on the best performing agent in the population. So specifically, as I said, at initialization, we initialize architecture, oh, sorry, we initialize agents of random hyperparameters and weights uh, in the original PBT case, they have the same architecture. And then we have uh, this exploitation and exploration uh, steps at regular intervals, uh, let's say maybe a few million uh, time steps. So at exploit step, the weights of the best performing agents are copied over the worst performing agents. And the weights of the worst performing agents are just simply discarded. And then at the explore exploration type uh, uh, step, what we do is instead of just using the exact hyperparameter of the best agent, um, we also want to have diversity because we want to find even better uh, hyperparameters. So what the original PPT do is they just perturb the hyperparameters randomly um, in, a, in a similar fashion to an evolutionary algorithm to something that's close to its original value. And we just keep doing it uh, until convergence. And um, improvement on top of that is um, PB2, uh, population-based bandit optimization. So this is proposed by one of my co-authors, Jack, uh, in 2019, I think. So the key difference is on the exploration step. So instead of perturbing the hyperparameters randomly, uh, they, f they first fit a time-variant Gaussian process surrogate. So they reformulate the problem as a time-varying basin optimization uh, problem. So instead of just suggesting uh, hyperparameters randomly, they will follow the suggestion of this basin optimization agent. Um, in that work, a standard GP surrogate was used, uh, which is suitable for optimizing continuous hyperparameters. Um, but as I said, in RL setting, we can also have um, variables that are not continuous. And previous literature in BO has shown that, um, of course, there are some methods in just wrapping those uh, discrete uh, variables into continuous ones, but um, usually there's benefit in like treating the discrete variable uh, in a discrete way, in, in a sense that we have this tailored treatment to different types of variables. And then improvement of that is exactly to address the problem I mentioned, uh, also by Jack, uh, we had we had the PB2 mix, I think, from last year. And again, the key difference is on the exploration step. We still have the same architecture, uh, but now we instead of using a vanilla GP surrogate, we use this Coca BO surrogate, uh, which is also proposed by our authors, uh, uh, Bingxing. So Coca BO, so, uh, Coca -BO surrogate uh, features a tailored treatment. Uh, it has some multi embedded to handle the categorical variables and a Gaussian process to handle the continuous variables. So that makes it suitable to optimizing both categorical and continuous variables. But there are still some uh, like remaining uh, questions to be answered. Uh, for example, like well, we also have ordinal variables that are somewhere in between. So they are discrete, but there exists ordering in the variable such as the number of depths, uh, the depths of uh, neural networks. 
uh, we'd expect a, a net network with um, depth three would be more similar to two than to a network of depth one. Uh, so that's why you have ordering. But if we just treat them as categorical variables, we essentially ignore that uh, because categorical variables essentially say that three is as different to two um, to one, which is not really the case. And then- Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. When you say that there is a multi-armed bandit uh, handling the categorical variables, uh, that, that seems a bit tricky in the sense that um, if you have multiple categorical variables, then uh, you have a combinatorial problem. And uh, if you use uh, some kind of you know naive bandit solution, um, this is not going to be efficient in solving this problem. So do they just use like a standard solution or they have something really custom for combinatorial bandit problems? I think they have some independence assumption to make it not combinatorial. Uh, but okay. yeah, I, okay. I, I think we need to that, check that. Makes that makes it much easier, okay. Yeah, yeah, it makes it much easier, but there is a, it's a very strong assumption, especially uh, you'd expect sometimes the hyperparameters to be dependent on each other. Completely agree. Yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it, I think Coca Bio is publishing ICML uh, 2019, so uh, we can take a look. I mean, if we have time, but yeah, so that is some previous work. So uh, yeah, so the question is, um, we find that like first we have ordinal variable, that's what I said, and secondly we also find that we have some scalability issue in Coca Bio uh, to higher dimensions. Um, like if you have lot large number of uh, categorical variables or within each category variable, you have like lots of choices. Uh, it seems like we found that Coca Bio sometimes have problems. And lastly, it's like the question I asked in the very beginning as my presentation, can we extend from HPU to doing HPU and neural architecture search at the same time? So those are the questions we want to address in our work. So uh, the question like, on the final final bit is actually not that trivial. Uh, it's because um, typically in normal, like in previous PBT style work uh, at this exploitation step, we just copy the weights over. Uh, but when you have different architectures, of course the weight will be not having the same shape and it will be not straightforward just to copy the weight over as a way to exchange information between agent. So we want, and. We, we want to maintain diversity in architecture in population. And at the same time, we want to use PBT style updates. So the solution we propose is we use generational training uh, with distillation. So we, we split into two steps. The first, like between generations, uh, we have this exploration in architecture. So we initialize a population with diverse architecture types. So in general, if we have like eight different uh, agents in the population, we will have eight different architectures. So that is where we do exploration. And then at exploitation is within a generation. Uh, what we do is agents with suboptimal architectures are overwritten with a good performing ones. So we not only just copy over the weights, we also copy over the architecture. But in, in doing that within the generation, you expect that at the end of the generation, you will no longer have like very diverse architectures because you will only have like a few better ones, maybe one or two that would be empirically observed if we use population size of eight, which is our default in the paper. And apart from that, there are actually several other benefits. I mean, also shown in previous work in the use of KL uh, distillation in reinforcement learning. So the first thing, of course, like I said, is we extend search to architectures. And secondly, it also allows us to reset the agent uh, because PBT method uh, known to like uh, converge often into suboptimal modes in the, the way space, especially when the population size is small, uh, because they will just quickly talk over each other and, and exchange over weights and hyperparameters, uh, but they, did, they do not explore sufficiently. Uh, that's why traditionally PBT methods often require a rather large population size to significantly outperform random search. Uh, for like a scenario where um, the population size is small, like four or eight, we often observe that random search actually outperform. That is also what we've shown uh, in our case, uh, like uh, using the uh, usual PBT method. And then distillation, it, on, it just allows co uh, behavior copying, but not weight copying. So in a sense that it uh, 
at each generation, we retain the behavior more or less, but we reset the agents so they still have this learning cap capability. So we found that that's all one of the reasons why um, the agent can keep improving when we have like a new generation. Um, good question. Here. So distillation, what do, do you distill and what? So do you distill one generation into another generation? Um, yeah, I will talk about that like maybe okay. in the next slide. But in short, what we do is at the end of generation, we just pick the best one in that uh, generation. And we always just start a new population, like with like, uh, uh, like we start a new population of agent. Then we just do the divert uh, distillation from the best mm -hmm. uh, agents from the last generation to the ones in the new generation. So that's what we did. But I will talk more on that, like maybe in next slide also. Yeah, so now I'm finally ready to talk about our algorithm. So firstly, within a generation, that's what I said, the, um, like the second, second step here, but I just show it here first. So at initialization, the key difference here is instead of just uh, having different random hyperparameters, we'll also have different architectures, as you can see on the figure. So the four, uh, four agents do not have the same architecture in general. And then at the exploitation step, as I mentioned, we copy over not only uh, the best agents hyperparameter, sorry, the best agent weight, but we'll also copy over the architectures. So on the figure, you can see that if we deem that the, the green one, the, the agent one, the architecture is bad, uh, when we copy them over uh, from four, so the hyperparameters are suggested by BO, which is similar to uh, what uh, previous PB2 and PB2 mix does. But at the same time, the, the uh, architecture of four is copy over one. So as, as I said, towards the end of generation, uh, the agents only feature a few different architectures. So this is similar in a sense to successive halving. So it's like, will we deem like some uh, architectures are not good? So they get eliminated quite early on and the good architectures uh, get trained for a longer period of time. And then at exploration uh, step, like I said, the hyperparameters are suggested by this time varying high dimensional BO agent. And we use for the objective function for this BO, we use the same, uh, we use this, we follow uh, PB2 and PB2 mix because uh, they've shown that it performed pretty well. So you use the difference in RL reward between intervals. Uh, we actually tried a few different things because we know that this RL reward can be noisy. So what we can do is just take uh, the final time steps and do some averaging. Uh, so that will get some average reward. Uh, but actually we found that in our, maybe it's just the environment we've tried, like doing that doesn't help significantly over what we do just simply by taking the, uh, taking the difference in reward. I think the reason could be like, we're not tra just training like one agent, we're training like eight of them. So maybe like you have already have some averaging in that uh, for the GP to handle. And we use a cosmopolitan agent uh, so cosmopolitan uh, is uh, a method um, we developed uh, uh, last year, uh, but mainly for as a generic BO method for mixed variable and high dimensional Bayesian optimization. Uh, so the two key features uh, is firstly, it features trust region um, so that during BO search, it only like looks around the neighborhood, uh, uh, like around the best hyperparameters in so far. So that's the key thing uh, people have shown that to make BO work in high dimensions because it restricts uh, the volume that the GP model has to model. But in this case, it actually has some unique uh, advantages we found because it avoids large jumps in hyperparameter values. Uh, so that's a, quite a unique thing in this auto RL setup because in, for example, in PB2, what we found that because they have a global GP model uh, that doesn't restrict how different the two successive time steps, the hyperparameters are, we can often see like the GP model select a very different hyperparameter uh, to what we see here. And often that's not really good for reinforcement learning stability. But in our case, like we, we avoid that because we, we restrict ourselves to this trust region. And the second thing is we have this mixed input uh, treatment uh, because cosmopolitan use a Taylor kernel that handles uh, the categorical and continuous parts differently. Um, but different from Coca BO, we do not use a multi M bandit. We just unify everything into a Gaussian process. And another thing is, we also feature this what we call interleaved optimi acquisition optimization, 
So we do one step of uh, update doing acquisition function optimization in continuous variables using gradient descent and another step in um, the categorical variables or the ordinal variables in local search. Uh, and we just repeat that on two convergence. So we found that that's something worked pretty well. Uh, so, I mean, that's suitable in this case, because as I said, we have both ordinal and continuous hyperparameters. And then another thing is the architecture dimensions are not tuned because like we cannot really create new, uh, uh, we, we, I mean, we do not create new architectures within a generation, but they are just treated as variables conditional uh, that we condition now during acquisition function optimization. So we, so they're still treated as a part of the GP surrogate, but we do not, we freeze those uh, dimensions. And yeah, and across generations, that's probably uh, what uh, Aaron asked just now, um, more relevant to what Aaron asked just now. So um, at initialization, uh, at the first generation, so that's a very, at the very start, we just fill the population with random architectures. And in subsequent generations, uh, we tried a different options. Um, so a few things like we, we, we can just like randomly sample again, but we just add some, uh, the best architectures from the previous generation. Um, I think that's similar to one of the paper that uh, I've seen on like using Bandit to, to uh, do auto ML is like, they found that you always, it's always advantageous to have, uh, when you're doing related tasks to have the best architecture from the previous tasks you include that in the pool manually. So we are just doing similar thing here. And another thing is uh, we can also fit a GP model based on the observation of a previous uh, generation, but only on the architecture gen dimensions. So we want the GP model to predict what's the, be what's the best for us. Uh, but empirically we found that, I mean, it, both of them are work fine as long as you have some trade-off between exploration and exploitation is that you have some new architectures not seen so far, but you also have some good architectures you already know from the previous generation. As long as we have some balance over there, uh, we should get like similar, like similar-ish result, I guess. And then question is how to start a generation. Uh, we are doing this a bit heuristically. So I think this uh, maybe is something we can improve on later. Uh, so what we do is just as long as like the training, the previous generation stops improving. So if we see the best uh, uh, agent across all the population, they do not improve a lot, uh, like a lot when we train further, uh, then we just set like a prefix that number of intervals where it doesn't do better. Uh, if we see that, we're just going to restart a new generation. And all like, we also set like a maximum number of time steps uh, because sometimes uh, like the, uh, the agent might be still improving, but over a very small, tiny amount. And we just set a maximum time step uh, so that if we reach that, regardless of what, we just restart a new generation. And then yes, and the transfer of knowledge across generations. So we use this on policy care distillation with the best agents of the previous generation's teachers. And then we just linearly anew between KL loss and RL loss terms. So at the end of distillation, only RL remains, RL term remains and the teacher is detached. So for that period of time, you can see that both of them are training but the teacher is just trained on RL laws, but the student is traced on a linear combination between KL laws and RL laws. So the details are in our paper. So we found that this is actually very crucial. If we just use KL laws, we actually see that the student can imitate teacher behavior quite in a rapid way. But when we discharge the teacher, we'll see performance collapse because he hasn't really uh, like seen the samples on policy. And we found that this is actually an important part because we thought that uh, we can just do distillation and it will work. But unfortunately that was not the case. So a price we pay is we do uh, train for longer time steps during that period because during the distillation, we kind of train both teacher and student. So that's a price we pay. Uh, both of them require on-sample policy, uh, like samples, yeah. Sorry, on policy samples, yeah. So finally, just put them together. So uh, this is example of a run of BGPBT on half cheetah environment in uh, Brax. So in this case, we have three generations and we do distillation between generation one, two and generations two and three. So what I found that is that 
um, it, it actually suggests quite different um, uh, set of architectures that have a parameters at different stage of training. So in this particular case, we find that at the initial stage, it seems to favor a smaller uh, policy and value network, but at the end, you can see that it choose something much larger. And we can also see the benefit of uh, this poly um, generational training here uh, is uh, like after the distillation, the agent starts with similar reward as the end of previous generation, but it still managed to improve quite significantly after that. Whereas if we just train a single generation uh, as marked by the back best baseline, uh, you will just tend to saturate. Uh, so yeah, so that is why we should, that is an empirical observation of the benefit that I described just now. Yes, and for the experiment, we, we test on a number of uh, BRAX environments. So those are the ones available to us uh, when we are writing this paper, uh, because BRAX is very much an uh, experimental package. So uh, I think they, they probably support more environment now, but back then those are the ones we, we, we uh, we had so so we compare against uh, PB2 and PBT um, and also random search. We it's a random search shown here is like the best of these two possible random search algorithms. So it's either random search over only have a parameters with the fixed architectures recommended by the Brax authors. I want to emphasize that this fixed architecture is not some like random baseline. Um, we actually did some grid search by modifying this architecture. And we found that at least on end, this is very close to the optimal value of the architecture. So this suggests that when the BRAX or the, they are making BRAX, they also probably did some research over the architectures. That's why I made them to choose the architectures recommended uh, as default in BRAX package. And the second uh, variant is random search with both hyperparameters and architecture space. Uh, we call it RSJ and RSZ. So the gray line show is the better of RSZ and RSJ. Um, so in this case, we do see, uh, if for most environments, we see quite a big improvement over, uh, let's say, PB2 and PBT. Uh, I think the one reason why PB2 is not doing so well in this case is it actually tunes much larger number of hyperparameters than it was used in the original PB2 uh, paper. So I think they originally just tuned four hyperparameters, but we are tuning like, let's say 12 or even more. And we know that BO have this like mm, problem uh, where we just, just increase the high dimension, use the high dimensionality, but without this high dimensional BO uh, modification. So uh, that could be a reason. Yeah. And yeah, just some visual comparison between uh, tuned PPO, um, so on the left, we have cheetah and ant. Uh, so in this case, all, both algorithms are working, but I think PBT uh, features, uh, you know, a more balanced uh, like behavior and it, it, it just seems less awkward, I mean, visually. And on the right-hand side, we have some more challenging environment. So the hop environment in Brax is very challenging. Uh, they still have an open issue. Last time I checked was in July that uh, it's difficult to uh, find a set of hyperparameters that works. Um, I think the, the issue, the person who raised the issue was referring to like soft actor critic, but we also find it's very difficult to find uh, a suitable PPO or hyperparameter. So the default PPO just fails. Uh, it just doesn't doesn't like move properly. But we found that our algorithm finds a working uh, uh, like set of hyperparameters that enable the agent to train. And the bottom right is just some industry robot uh, experiment. You can also see that um, the PBT is just much better in this case in like identifying um, this picking up this ball. Yeah. And another thing we do is we also want to analyze whether the learned schedules make sense. Uh, so what we do is um, we have the, we just plot the best agent out of that population of eight agents as a function of the number of time steps. And then we just average that across a different seed. I think we tried seven seeds. So that's where we see the error bar and mean comes from. Um, and I think one interesting phenomenon seen here is for and uh, for example, we see this decreasing learning rate and increasing batch size quite consistently, especially on learning rates. Um, 
you still see that decay. So at the beginning, it choose something that is rather big, let's say uh, five to the power of minus four, but it just anew that uh, as the training progresses. So I think this is something discovered completely independently by BGPBT. But at the same time, uh, this is quite similar to what people usually do. Uh, so it seems like it's at least finding something that's very sensible. Uh, but of course, we hope that we will find something that we do not know beforehand. But I think the fact that it finds something that we know, we do know beforehand, is like a demonstration of that it's able to identify uh, useful hyperparameter uh, schedules. And we'll also find that, for example, in this case for the architecture, uh, it identified like an increasing policy network size. So it favors something uh, quite small, uh, which is also coincidentally consistent to the default value provided by, by the Brax authors. Uh, so the default policy network is 64 with. So that is exactly what this uh, BGPB discovered as well. But I like, let's say after one generation, it just decides that maybe something that is wider is better. So that's just an example. Yeah. And we have some similar uh, finding for like say a different environment, but uh, for example, on learning rate, we do see this consistency in this tendency to decrease that uh, over uh, the training. But the one key thing is uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't decay in the same way. Uh, so for ant, it decays much faster to the smallest possible value of 10 to the power of minus four, but for half cheetah, it does that more gradually. And we have more um, like such plot in the uh, paper that shows on other environment. And we sometimes we, we do see a consistent trend, but sometimes we see slight differences in the behavior. And yeah, so this is a comparison we also made against a sequential BO. Um, I think we you just use a SMAC uh, uh, as the BO algorithm. So what sequential BO does is um, it will just tune the hyperparameter sequentially. So it will just initialize with a few um, it random initializations and just and then it will just pick a fixed set of architectures that do not adapt over uh, the training. And then given, we just train for a full 115 million and given the feedback, we just feedback them to the BO and just do that in the usual BO manner. And in this case that um, we find that even if we try BO with like longer training periods, uh, like BGPBT sometimes still can perform better or at least similarly uh, for most environments. There are a few environments that BO is better, like humanoid, wheelchair, and fetch. Uh, but in others, BGPBT remain quite competitive. I will also conduct an ablation study on whether it, like both components, the first component is this high dimensional tailored BO agent. The second component is whether we want to have architecture search. We want to see whether both of them lead to performances. Uh, I mean, the result here is a little bit mixed. I mean, we do have some uh, environment where it seems like architecture search uh, actually make it worse. But I think there could be, I'm going to discuss later. It could be some other reasons we hope we can address in the future. So, yeah. So we do still have some open questions. So firstly is this automation of PBT hyperparameters themselves, especially we have this distillation hyperparameters. Uh, actually recently I found that the performance can be quite sensitive to this, especially on distillation time steps. So on that, we are still like doing that in this kind of magic number in a heuristic way. We just decide what the weight of RL loss to um, RL loss to KD loss or, or like how many time steps we want to distill. And we found that the performance can be quite sensitive to this. Uh, and I think a better way would be coming out with a better way rather than just like magic numbers, which what we ultimately want, want to eliminate, uh, want to reduce the use of those. And secondly, we want to improve architecture selection. So as I said earlier, in some cases, uh, beach PBT without architecture selection performs better. So we observe that the reason is sometimes during the architecture selection stage, a poor architectures are proposed and then just discard it during generation. And during that period of time, we're not gain, gaining much because uh, it just tried to remove all the bad ones but without learning further. So I think there's open question on how to do that better. And lastly, is what we observed is sometimes we have this convergence uh, into stable but suboptimal behaviors. So this is something I mentioned that is quite common in the usual BG, uh, PVT uh, paradigm. But we're still seeing it more or less uh, like 
like for example here, the reason is like say for the humanoid, it's not really using the ankle joint. So it's just it's just trying to use less degree of freedom. And for the um, Hopper experiment, he just learned to stand but not move. Uh, because I think that's also partly because of reward design, because in Bragg's, um, just it to receive a reward just by learning to stand up. So those are very stable behaviors, but uh, they are suboptimal. I think the reason is uh, the PBT paradigm we're using is still more or less myopic. It will just try to maximize uh, this uh, reward difference between the current interval and the previous interval. It would be really nice if we can have some, for example, a look ahead to uh, uh, encourage um, exploration so the behavior that are observed do not happen. So those are the open questions and the limitations of, previous, um, of the current work, uh, which I think would be something interesting uh, for the community to look after in the future. So yeah, I think that's more or less my presentation. So in summary, we propose BGPBT, that two supposed to have a parameters and architectures in RL environment, simultaneously using BO, and we also leverage generational training. And here is a paper, the code, and my email. Uh, and if you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out. And yeah, I would say thank you very much for your time and uh, be open to questions.